Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome uh, to the ISN New Jersey Meet the Author series. If you should have a question for our author, please make sure to put it in the Q&A or the chat bar. At this time, I would like to welcome today's newest author, Julian Ryan, and turn our program over to our guest host for today, Sarah Scudder, who is the president of Real Sourcing Network. Thank you, Kathy. I feel right at home. I love being involved in the ISM New Jersey event, so thanks for asking me to host. And it's quite an honor. Uh, Julie and Ryan and I have been friends for a few years and mm -hmm. have in, really enjoyed um, her book and am super excited to be able to tell her journey and story today. So Julian, also known as Jules, <laughs> Um, is the author of Learned It in Queen's Communication Playbook, Winning Against Digital Distraction. I have a little show and tell here to show you her book, actually. If you've noticed that the digital age has created new problems in connecting with others, her book offers straightforward answers on how to communicate more effectively. Some of the things that I really love about the book is it's really short and easy to read. So for those of you who have followed me on LinkedIn or heard me speak before, I am not a big fan of reading books. So I have to say her book is super fun, lighthearted, a very quick and easy read. I also love that she has a genuine New York accent guide that you can use while reading the book. And following her tips is a lot cheaper than hiring a lawyer. And I'm speaking from experience. There's a few attorneys in the Scudder family. So I've known Jules for about four years and we connected because of my involvement in the procurement industry. Communication is really important in being successful in procurement because procurement professionals need to win over and get buy-in from their stakeholders. So Jules, with that, I have to say, I love your short hair and it makes me, I, I used to have short hair until COVID happened. So I haven't had a haircut since February. So wow. it's my inspiration to be able to go back and, and get my short hair. Um, so Jules, one of the things that I, I really liked about your book was that you talked about words and phrases specifically relating to growing up in Queens. Mm -hmm. So why don't you tell us some of your favorite words or phrases? Well, one of them is, what are you kidding me? Um, of course, I'm going to tell you my favorite expressions. One of them is, have you eaten? Constantly brings up in conversation. So Sarah, I'm going to pose that question to you. I hope you ate. I hope you had a nice lunch because I don't want you feeling faint or, you know, just being weak during this interview. So you need all your strength and we're going to have this conversation. So that's one of them. And just funny things like, don't even talk to me about it. There might be a phrase, but there are a whole story of emotions packed into those when somebody throws you those phrases mm -hmm. and um, have a real strong message behind it. Mm -hmm. We are very critical people in a way. We're very ironic and we're quick to make a comment and an assessment. And that's what I like about some of the people I grew up with. Not all of them, but some of them. <laughs> so I have a, a lot of my friends are entrepreneurs and mm -hmm. they have published book books either through publishers or using Amazon Create Spaces. And I always hear, oh, writing a book is so hard. It's so much work. It takes so much time. And a lot of them I know will, you know, block out time every day and then things get derailed and, and schedules, schedules get pushed back. Talk to me about the inspiration behind your book, because again, writing a book is so much work and really takes a lot of, of thinking and trying to articulate a message that you want to share with the readers. Well, ironically, the book started with a speech and it started with the procurement world, which is really true. I was invited on the strength of a conversation to become a humorous keynote speaker at the ProcureCom event. And I met some great people, um, Frank Muzera, Jennifer Platt, who were brave and courageous and decided I would be a great out of the box, something unusual interview speaker at uh, the day three of their conference. So I had some thoughts because I've given talks, I've given speeches on communication and teamwork. And then Joanna Martinez, who we all know and love, had the good graces to invite me to breakfast. And at which point she asked me, so what are you gonna talk about? And I described my process 
And she happened to say one important question. Did they not tell you you're going to be standing on the big stage? Not in the room down the hallway like I envisioned at some breakout room, but on the big stage. So part of my speech then was started with fear because it was like, that changes the whole relationship with the audience, how I'm gonna interact, how I'm gonna present. And I knew in my heart of heart, I need to keep it authentic literally because I couldn't just make up anything and say, here's a bunch of bullets about communication. Everybody's heard it. Everybody's heard um, lectures about communications. I wanted something fresh and unusual. So the book came from the speech because it took me about two years to really settle down after the, the original bunch of speeches I gave and realize that it had um, relevance um, for current times. We all need help. And it's not meant to talk at you. It's meant to give you some inspiration to make fun of ourselves and then start to pay attention to what we're doing wrong and right and the little things. Because the little things always start with the big problems. So I have a big bunch of thank yous <laughs> to the procurement world that who would have known procurement would be the uh, incentive to write a book. You can't make this up. And I would say that us procurement folks is not your easiest audience. So being thrown in on the big stage keynoting a conference to procurement people is not easy. Yes. Yes. And I was the, I was, I always have an expression, one of these things is not like the other. And that's usually how I show up at all these conferences, tech procurement, and then there's me. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things that I think just happened to turn out and be really relevant is your book not only talks about in person communication, but digital communication, which has become so important this year and will continue because so many more people are now working remotely from home from their houses and or not from a main corporate office. And not all things about digital communication are good. Mm -hmm. So what are some bad things about digital communication that you thought of or noticed or experienced as you were writing your book? The good things and the bad things are very related. The bad thing about digital is we can respond quickly. We can respond in the moment. We can react right away. And that can be bad if we haven't had a chance to take a step back and reflect on what's the triggers? Why am I overreacting? And then many of us, myself included, we write in a shorthand that we think the other person understands all the nuances in our words. So I think there's that basically, because we don't have the cues. So I make an analogy that we are like the directors of a movie when we're, we're in digital, we're writing, we're writing the script, we're inserting words that might not be there, we're making assumptions, and that's where we get into trouble um, and need to get out of our own way. So I always ask uh, clients and myself who's writing the script when I'm having a, a reaction or you know a dialogue, when I have one of these things next to me and I'm going, what the heck? Take a pause is my best advice there. And the good is that you can react really quickly and give somebody emoji or some shout out, but it's always good to have a little bit of a live conversation, whether it's challenging or there's positive. Yeah, given that everything has really gone digital, um, this year, luckily, so I run a startup and we've been remote since day one. So we've mm -hmm. never had offices. So we've been fully set up and, and running that way for a couple of years. But one of the, the things that I've really noticed that I think is challenging is having engagement at online events. Mm -hmm. So companies who used to host in-person events, ProcureCon is one that you mentioned that you spoke at, having those same events online, it's really, really hard to recreate mm -hmm. the in-person interaction. And so for me, that's one of the big challenges. And I think one of the negatives of the digital communication space is how can we have those networking experiences at large events online? I think part of it, because as a performer and doing speeches and I've done um, comedy shows live on Zoom during this whole point when people were muted. I've done presentations where I couldn't see anybody. 
when we do a conversation, it's a performance, it's live, it's in the moment. We feed off of each other's energy. So I think part of what we need to do when we're working with our teams in our groups is build relationships offline beforehand. Get to hear their voice on a one-to-one -one if you can manage the time. Do lots of little touch bases and keep reinforcing that. And the other part I find that keep it shorter. And most of the time, the presentations, a lot of folks I know um, that are working right now are going from one Zoom to another Zoom to another. And I think it's important to schedule breaks and downtime because when folks are getting off their Zooms for work, they're also going on to personal Zooms uh, to check in with family members or medical or school. So we're not meant to look like hieroglyphic creatures, you know, sitting, you know, upright in our chairs all day. So taking those creative breaks can really help re-energize and do phone. This was, this is the new luxury right now. I had a call the other day with a colleague and we wanted to talk about an event and she was like, let's do it Zoom free because I know what you look like. I just want to hear your voice and hear how you're thinking. So that is the new luxury. You don't have to have perfect lighting. You don't have to re-merchandise, you know, how you're looking. You can just be yourself. So I would guide everyone to mix it up and just pick and choose what the communication needs to look like. Yeah, I call it Zoom overload. When I <laughs> when I see people glossed over at the end of the day and they've been on eight or 10 Zoom calls, sometimes it can be a bit much. So I agree. <laughs> One of the things I've started doing when I'm scheduling meetings is sometimes I'll say, how about I'll just call your cell phone? Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I'm trying to bypass the constant Zoom or, you know, the constant online camera. I learned something years, decades ago, I took some acting classes and I did commercial work. And it takes an extraordinary amount of energy to project into a camera and exude the energy you have because I remember watching a student the camera and what it felt like and it seemed like she was screaming into the camera look or really yelling but when they did the footage back it was like she was moderately toned and it was surreal so we don't realize how much we're extending plus we're always really vigilant because we're trying to scan the screens and what I guide people to do is facilitate have somebody like you would have a note taker just checking in sometimes if you're preoccupied in what you're presenting to see if there's somebody who's trying to get a voice in or a word in or is disengaged a bit so I'm always like scanning scanning their the screens but it takes a lot I mean it does so one of the thing your book discusses is eight winning plays. <laughs> so tell me a story or share an example that will illustrate some of these ideas. Um, one of the winning plays is when you get stuck, do something else. Um, I have a very good friend and well, she's a good friend now. She started as a, an employee in a, in a group I was working with and she she talked about being stuck in her commute every day. And what she ended up doing was starting a, a blog and a, an advocacy group for her, her experience because she was like, I'm spending so much time on the New York subway. This train is never going to move. I might as well do something creative and help my fellow citizens. And I, it ended up being part of my speech in my book. Uh, so that's one. They keep it authentic is one of my favorites because it really was the incentive for me to write the book and how I approach this, the, uh, the speech. And I use a slice of pizza in the, in the book and I yeah, didn't come learned up with- how to eat a slice of pizza like a burger now. I'll make sure I never do it incorrectly. But here's the thing, the slice was like what we're talking about now because I have a wonderful art director who I had hired, who I had used to work with. And I wrote him all my notes about what I wanted for the, the, the actual speech for the screen and then ultimately for the book. And I said, I wanna have something that's New York and Queens and it's authentic and it feels like, and people are gonna get it and relate to it. And in my email, I get a slice of pizza and I'm like, I don't get it. And I'm like, so I had the dialogue and then I went, oh my God, it's beautiful. It's simple, it says it all, it's like, yeah. And you would be surprised at how many slices of pizza there are on stock photos and things. We've ended up shooting a real slice that he shot in his apartment because we, we never knew there was so much diversity in slices of pizza. And I had to have a New York one. And, I couldn't just and think. tell us what is the right way to eat a slice of pizza? Well, let's see. I have a piece of paper here. 
You have to pick it up. I know you're supposed to use knife and fork, but in New York, you fold it. I don't, I should have brought a triangle piece. We're getting an origami lesson too. Fold it. See, because you're walking and talking at the same time. You want to make sure you don't get it over you. So, you know, it's a, it's a very efficient piece of food. You can do that. And I'm looking forward to walking and talking and eating a slice of pizza soon in New York and being, you know, jostled. I miss that. So I have visited New York a fair amount in the last couple yeah. of years. Uh, the investors for my startup are actually based there. And I know we've been able to meet up a couple of times, which has been really fun, but I am not used to the subway. Yes. So I live in Danville. I'm an hour from San Francisco. We drive everywhere. And so that was a really big learning experience for me is how to navigate and manage the subway. I also learned you can learn a lot about people from riding mm -hmm. the subway. And I love that you talked about that in your book. So what can people learn from communication about riding the subway? And I want to show, I, I really enjoyed, so um, Jules book has some incredible um, photography. And this is one of the pictures that she has to highlight and talk about riding the subway. Well, first of all, the physicality of it, um, maybe going forward, we won't be as close to each other on the train, but there is a certain pride in being able to navigate the, the, the movement of the train. Most people are carrying five different things in their hands, trying to jostle you shoved in together. So you have to learn about cooperation. You have to learn about navigation. You have to figure out your height and whether you're gonna share space with somebody and, and how much space you want between you. Um, so that's one thing. Lots of people watching. I've seen incredible kindnesses uh, between passengers. Uh, for me, particularly, there was a few years back, I had a lot of pain in one side, I had trouble walking. And not the folks I assumed would give me a seat did. Uh, tough guys who look really gruff and mean were the ones giving me a seat on the train. I'm like, New Yorkers are kind. We're very odd sometimes, but we're, we're funny. And you can learn because, and first of all, coming from Queens, you lived on the train. You, you, you could have a whole life before you got to work. An hour and a half, an hour on a train, you get to do a lot of things. You get to read a book, a newspaper, you know, catch up on your life, people watch, check out what the fashion is. So you learn about your community, what the music is. We, we typically have a lot of musicians coming on board and that can be a whole interesting interaction to see what's, what's happening. I think one of, one of my most important subway riding tips is don't wear high heels. Hmm. Yeah, we got so great. You gotta wear flats. You gotta have comfies. If you wanna have your cute stilettos in your bag, do not wear them on the subway. I, I made that mistake once and I <laughs> learned very quickly that that was a bad idea. Yes, you have to be ready to move and take charge. I mean, I, I always admired because when I went into New York, sometimes you could always pick out the outer towners that were just basically making it from their cab to the building. You know, we you you have to be made for endurance and uh, any possibility. So, one of the other things you talk about in your book which I think is really really relevant to this year given that everyone's lives have been in some sort of chaos, mm -hmm. especially people who have children at home and are now becoming teachers and you know adding mm -hmm. a lot of extra duties to their normal workload. You talk about the, the fact that people aren't necessarily good at responding and getting back to people quickly. Mm. And I know from having experience in sales and marketing, it happens a lot. You'll send a note, you'll send a text, and then a week later and you have no response. And it's something that can be very frustrating. So what can people do to ensure that people respond to their communication in a more timely manner? I, I don't think there's a perfect solution, but I do think multiple touches. You remember, you mentioned text. Um, sometimes I am putting um, messages out on LinkedIn with, with, a, with a note saying, I don't know what you're going to read first, but I'm duplicating it just in case you have time. I think assuming that not everybody's reading your messages or heard. Sometimes I've missed somebody sending me an email and it went to a, a spam or something, or I meant to get back to it. So I think being patient and just not making assuming that I got it anywhere and just keep trying um, and repurpose that statement. Um, 
as much as you can. Managing the amount of emails too with the group, uh, we we tend to, especially if you have a big team, we want to keep everybody in the loop, but then we like copy the planet. I had one colleague who said when she went away on vacation, she she made a purpose not to read her emails, but then she goes. By the time I get back, they're going to figure it out. Like, I'm going to read the last two, almost like to see how did this movie end? You know, like, did you solve the problem or do I need to get back into the mix? So I think having some patience and also learning to curate your thoughts, because I know some of us get very excited at different hours in the morning or the day and think I have to share this right away. Not always the best idea. Maybe contain them. <laughs> And, and wait <laughs> to, to, to have a bigger email, not like a plethora of emails coming your way. It's enough. So there, there's a venture capitalist that I follow that, that writes a blog. And one of the things he does, de December 31st, he deletes all his emails. Wow. Okay. So he says, if I haven't taken the time to respond to your email or do something with it this year, it's probably not overly important. And he cleans it out and starts fresh on the first of every year. And I thought that was an interesting idea, meaning that if it's something that's important and relevant, you're going to touch on, touch it and jump on it right away. And if not, why have it sitting there clogging, clogging up your inbox and just and distracting you from other things? Something else that I, I you get many comments on that about like, am I in that delete list? <laughs> it's like, really? He <laughs> said, Just declare it. Wow. That's going to be what he says when people made some comments, he says, if it's that important to email me again, right? If I didn't respond and it's, it's something, then send me another note. Okay. Something for me that I know that I really appreciate when people are doing email communication in particular have a really clear, succinct title that talks specifically mm -hmm. about what's in the email. So I am someone that changes my email titles based on the back and forth of the email. So Jules, if you email me about a pizza recipe, it's going to be titled Sarah's pizza recipe, then in the dialogue, if we're shifting topics, and then I'm talking about your book, I'm going to change the subject line to say two questions about your book. What that allows us to do is know what's in the body of the email. And if I ever need to go back and reference it, I can easily find it. The other and I thing love you for that. Because <laughs> all of us have been like archaeologists going into 16... I worked in HR, we had like 16,000 emails about the same subject. You're like, just change the subject line so I know where you are. It's just like something new happened, yeah. you must read this. <laughs> so, so that is an inspiration. Yes, that's a simple, like, it doesn't take a lot of, you know, nope. time just it to takes, do that. You know, two email. seconds to change the title. The other thing that, that I have been very conscious of is when I send an email, it, I make it very short and I don't have more than two hours action items. Mm -hmm. If you put a really long email together and there's 15 things that you want people to do, they're not going to. So pick the two most important, make it a short, succinct email, make it a clear call to action. When that's done, you can follow up with another email with another set of action items. And I think that will save a lot of confusion and a lot of back and forth. Um, the third for me is put timelines in your email. So I will say, you know, if I'm asking somebody to speak at an event, please let me know either way by December 5th. You know, right? I do that. I do that with my husband. <laughs> I sent him text. We live in the same house. It's two floors away. And so that, that happens. I was like, why don't I apply what I do in business to the home? It will help. It gives us structure. And, and I have a traceable record of that. I did tell him. And, and you want to make sure you don't give people too much time to respond or it's out of sight, out of mind. So yeah. if you're saying, get back to me, do it within a week. If it's a month from now, forget it. So it needs, no, no. To, be, it needs to be a manageable schedule. This, this brings me into my next question, which is something you talk about in your book as well, is when should somebody try a new communication method? So Jules, we're email, you know, it's four or five emails in, like, how do we know when we should pick up the phone, send a LinkedIn note, send a text message, try something else? 
I truly believe in listening to your gut. If you have a fairly developed gut saying there's got to be a logical reason for the silence. And before we write the script in our head, like I said, is to pick up a phone and do a touch base. Sometimes I've used the device of calling what I think is going to be off offline hours and saying like, I'm just following up touch base, read this email, it's state stamped X, Y, and Z and do it. Because like I said, a lot of people are just overwhelmed and things happen. Um, I changed email servers. You, you want to make sure that things weren't caught, that they get caught in spam. Um, people that I write to all the time, sometimes their messages don't get through. If we have a fun graphic we think is so clever, we're adding and that ends up being the thing that gets shot. So I think just listening to your instincts and saying, is this normal for this person? Something else must be up. And usually it, there is. They've gotten something else that's distracted them, something in their life or something at work that's taken them away from what you need to do. We all think we're very important that we should be on top of everybody's list, but it doesn't always work out that way. So, so it is what it is. So one of the things we've implemented at, at my company is the two touch email rule. Hmm. So if you're interacting with a supplier, if you're interacting with a client and after two emails, there's still confusion, pick up the phone. Mm -hmm. I think people hide behind emails and written communication too much. And sometimes you need to pick up the phone to hear their voice, mm -hmm. to see them virtually, see their mannerisms. And I think there's a lot that you can be missing from mm -hmm. hiding behind emails. So I recommend picking up the phone and really having that one-to-one -one conversation can go a long way. You know, you reminded me of something that I do teach and talk about that you asked me earlier in our conversation about what's positive and negative about digital. The, the negative is that when you, if you are uncomfortable with the topic or uncomfortable with an interaction, it's so easy to do a touch and go and try to escape from that interaction and not really own that conversation. I would rather people practice and really learn how to give feedback how to have eye contact. Now, present day, uh, I would say it has to be on Zoom or, or a call or some kind of voice and something that's alive versus the text because then it's taking responsibility. And a lot of times you can get clarification and you may not like the answers, but at least you paid respect to that person that you thought that their time was valuable or they were valuable enough or important that you had the interaction. So that is the, that's yeah. the, the sticky part of digital that you can offload responsibility and think you're getting away with something. Okay, I've done that. I sent them a text. I've cleared the air. Probably building on the issue because yeah. sooner or later you're going to need to address it in some shape or form. Now, if we were back live again, I would say walk down the hallway or make a point to maybe in a neutral area have coffee or something or just meet up somehow but uh yeah don't don't hide the bigger the thing is the more you need to pick up the phone and talk to somebody yep and a couple comments in the chat patricia said email mm -hmm. subject lines are so important to her thanks for bringing that up uh, kim had a great recommendation with emails put in caps action required or some call out in the title <laughs> So it's very clear that a response is needed or somebody needs to take action. You can use yo <laughs> think, shock them into reading it or having a face or some even wit sometimes. Um, yep. I Look, I came out of HR, which is always an interesting experience, which basically meant I had to stalk people a lot of times in companies and follow them around and get them to talk. But having a sense of humor and just saying, look, I know you just can't wait to open your emails and see yet another message from me, uh, but making it easy and bringing the temperature down to say, we just need this. And if you give me five seconds, we can get it done. So yeah, taking patience and you know, using a lot of patience and creative methods. So one of the other things you talk about in your book is finding a positive coping technique. <laughs> you provide several different ideas and examples. I think the fa my favorite that you listed in the book is maintaining a chore drawer. So I'd like to know how the what the history is and how you came up with the the chore drawer idea. I think that we all have a junk drawer. We all have something in our desk that we need to organize or fix or put back together. So a lot of times it's about shifting the energy 
we're waiting, we're stuck, we're, we're bored, we're, we're like, we've had a call we're supposed to do and it's been canceled. So just do something with that energy and, and things will happen. A lot of times the right conversation will happen. So I am big believe in saying, use the time, distract yourself, reboot, do something that's energetic. Now I cook and now they're, we're home, I cook all the time. So it's like, okay, let me walk down and dice up some vegetables and stand. And that's usually when I have the best um, thoughts. I'm going to say ideas because I hear the word like in my, my accent, but um, things come to mind. We we're not meant, I said, to sit always at a desk. So just reboot and walk away and just give yourself time to listen. And then lo and behold, a lot of times that person gets back to you sooner or later. And is it always a crisis? No, we, we kind of make things into like a crisis sometimes. But give it time. Do something with your energy and your skill sets. You're smart people. Do something. So what I what I've done is I'm I'm building a a, a drawer in our kitchen and I'm calling it five minute projects. So it's things like I need to fix a necklace ah. or untangle a bracelet. I'm we're so I'm putting everything in the drawer. So I'm going to try my chore drawer for thirty days and I'll I'll let you know how it goes. Okay, you can put it on Instagram and pin interest things I fixed. <laughs> So one of the other things you talk about in your book is hanging on to your inner child. Mm. So tell us what this means and why this is important in effective communication. Okay. First of all, my book is based on a lot of good psychology and therapeutic principles, but I chose not to cite them in the book. I want to make it fun. So hanging on to your inner child is we know each of us have positive and negative triggers of what we need or hope to have in, a, in an interaction. So sometimes hanging on to that child and knowing what sets them off, just like a regular kid, have, did they get enough food? You know, are they tired? You know, have they had a bad day? Did they have a negative interaction with somebody? And now they're into another conversation. So holding on to and just really knowing what our weaknesses are and what sets us off. And like I said, who's right in the dialogue and just giving ourselves a pause. We can do so much good if we just stand away from our technology for five minutes, walk away, just re freshen up and um, jump up and down, do some exercise and just take a pause. I, I think one of the things that sets me off seems pretty small and minor, but it's one of my biggest pet peeves. It's when somebody sends a mass group email to 50 people mm -hmm. and asks, what time are you available? And then 50 separate email responses instead of using an automated program like Doodle, where you send a link and everyone goes in and clicks their availability. So for me, mass emails where there's all this unnecessary back and forth to me drives me absolutely bonkers. And I think it's a huge time suck. The other one about group is, does every interaction need an audience? Especially if it's something you're not clear or I'm not clear on, you're not clear on, that you need clarification. So I'm always questioning people when they've done that. It's like, what were you hoping to be the reaction? You know. Where you wanted to show you're smart, where you're trying to get your point across, where you was it a little politicking that you were doing? Um, what's the point? So I'm a big believer in do it privately. Um, if you need clarification, save face is a big expression. It's not a queen's expression. I do believe in saving face, getting clarity, and then discussing bigger things in group and figure out what needs to be discussed in a group. Um, we can limit the amount of time that needs to be a big group email. Yeah, and, and for me, the, one of my other pet peeves is <laughs> unnecessary meetings. So okay. I, I run a startup, so we're very small and nimble team. We almost never have meetings because we use Slack and other project management tools. But I have friends that work at large companies. Mm -hmm. And you look at their calendar, they're literally in meetings from eight in the morning to five, and they have no time to do any work. So then they're scrambling at night and on the weekends to actually do work. And I'll say, how many of those meetings did you actually need to have? And it might be, you know, one out of 10 meetings is actually a meeting that needed to take place. So another thing that drives me crazy is people who just schedule meetings. If you can communicate and put it in an email, do it and mm -hmm. don't schedule a meeting just to schedule a meeting. Well, you bring up a good point. Uh, one friend of mine who's a chief financial officer said, instead of 
having more time on their hands to do the work, she found that the group was getting in obsessed with, not obsessed, but I just unconsciously start to just book everything as a meeting when COVID was just starting. And what she wanted to recreate is those moments where she would come out of her office, go down the hallway, tap somebody in the shoulder, give them feedback about something, saying, do this, take that out of the memo, walk back to her office, close the door, and she was good to go. So it's that little human interaction. So figuring out what's short, what is it that's so important that you need a group session? So back to your phone call, back to um, limiting it and um, finding time to work. And everyone has different schedules. There's no starts to beginning. So everybody's day is uniquely different. So also honoring a little bit of that about where the boundaries need to be and um, get creative. So a, a, a phrase that you mention and talk about in your book is don't let assumptions and trends front spoil your day. What does that mean? <laughs> Again, the voice in our head, if we haven't had communication, if we haven't talked to it, again, who is writing the dialogue and is it reasonable and is it real? And maybe you need to step away from that and do something else. So it can, our all internal dialogue could be our worst enemies about, okay, you send a project in or a proposal, oh, they must not like it, or they, they're, they're not going to back to me, we're going to get hired. So you start to talk to yourself and create a scenario that doesn't even exist. So I think that is something to, to pause and, and just make notes, maybe write a note to yourself and make a, um, a list of saying, okay, this is what I'm concerned about and just put it to the side, make a list and just put it away and stop thinking about it and do something else. Stop our inner voices. Yes. <laughs> so one of my favorite photos in your book, and I love that you talk about the eight different communication techniques and you use pictures to illustrate what you're trying to communicate. I think that's super powerful and breaks up the written words. So lo love that um, love that idea that you incorporated. One of my favorite photos is the one on the front. Is it pronounced front stoop? Yes, perfect. Okay. So how do you find your front stoop and how do I create something like that virtually? Sarah, if there's anyone who knows what a front stoop is intuitively, it's you. From the moment I met you, you were like the Pied Piper of humanity, gathering people. You want these people to do it naturally for your work and your, for your personal life. It's finding moments to really connect. Um, when we get to meet with folks in person, it's getting out of our chairs, meeting with people, and spending a few minutes investing in time and getting to know them and really having a dialogue um, because our history is so uniquely different. So I think it's about finding those places of comfort that we can build some trust and appreciate that other person's experience. So it's small and little things and can be a front step sometimes, but a lot of times it's a table, an office, sitting in a park bench someplace, having fun, but spending time and finding that place of trust that you can build. And it solves a lot of issues. Uh, again, I go back to my years in HR where I spent way too much time at lawyers. And a lot of the problems were because people had assumptions and nobody was really having a dialogue. They were so scared about being litigious or the fact that lawyers had been called in, they stopped having dialogues about what was really going on with human dynamics. So taking a pause and just showing up and listening. Um, when you build trust, and here's the thing, when you invest the time to meet with people, when there is a crisis, when there is something that you have to address that might be very impactful, you would have already established an identity of somebody that takes time to care, take time to listen and give direct feedback. And it'll be easy to hear that if the first time somebody's interacting you is not when there's bad news. And that's the only time they hear from you. So I think it's investing in the time and the people that build trust and listen. So I'm on a mission to build virtual stoops because we need ways to talk to each other and get past some assumptions we may have about how we're working and who we're working with and why we're working the way we are. I think that's a great 2021 hashtag, virtual stoop. Mm -hmm. 
I'm going to start using it. I, I really like that terminology yeah. about it's, it's a fun way to talk about connecting and, and building rapport with somebody. And that's where I want to take it. That's my mission, virtual stupid meetings and starting to interview more people and learning about lessons learned. You know, I think we learn from each other about management and how we, uh, we came to be and uh, teaching. We learn from experience. We don't learn from bullets. So one of the things that I, I learned from reading your book is the importance of food <laughs> for people that live in Queens. And it seems like the broader New York as well. I, I didn't know it was such, such an important part of daily life and the culture there. But what I think is interesting about you bringing that up in your book is I think it's relevant to communication and, and people no matter where they live. So why is the capacity to eat other people's food so important and how does that relate to communication? When we meet somebody at a table and we're sharing a meal, um, we learn about more about how they think just from the simple act of what kind of foods they like, why they eat what they do, what gets them excited. Some people love desserts, some people love, you know, vegetables and how, if they cook, if they don't cook, it's a way of connecting and it's very primitive and it's the most basic thing we can do. Now on my end, because Queens had so many different nationalities, I got to sit out of a lot of different tables. Uh, I had a group of young uh, friends in high school, their mothers were from Cuba. I went, to their apartment. And I remember one friend started to interpret in Spanish what her mother was saying. And then by the time we finished, she stopped interpreting because her mother kept feeding me, with it, even when I said I didn't want it anymore. But the mother was asking what everybody else was asking. Are you good in school? Are you studying hard? Are you going to go to college? So I didn't speak Spanish, but I got the whole gist by the time we're done. And meanwhile, I had like food coming at me nine different directions. And it's, it's a form of appreciation. Now, if you cook for me, that is an amazing experience. Then we're then we're soulmates for life because you took the time to make something with your own hand and put your heart into it. So, and I think everybody shares a little bit about that. Plus the fact that I grew up with a lot of different immigrants. I'm first generation. So everyone had their own recipes of what home felt like and what was unique about it. But I love food. I just, you know, I'm and always- it sounds, it sounds like from some of the stories in your book that People sometimes are so into food, they eat first and then talk later. Sometimes it's a help. You know, if you do that, that you might circumvent a lot of issues. <laughs> you may, it's a good distraction. Let me put it this way. And I'm sure a few people always say, yes, that typically helps us at dinner on some holidays when things can be a little dicey. You know, you slow people down, you make them feel nurtured and loved, and then you can have the big chat with them. Uh -huh. yeah, it's an intervention. So one of the other things you talk about is as a child, you watched Columbo uh, on TV. So tell us who, who is Columbo ah. and, and what important lessons did he teach you um, that you're still using today, actually? Yeah. Okay. So not now. Pay attention now. You can Google later. Columbo was this crazy, ordinary character who was a mess, basically. He was working his beat as a detective. He, he could only see out of one eye. His raincoat was scruffy. He looked a little bit off kilter, like you could get one over on him, but he was super smart. And his, his thing was always to listen, ask a lot of critical questions, and then he would come back with one more question that would nail it and show that he figured out what was going on with the criminal or that somebody was trying to scam him. So it just stayed with him because he was unique. He was unpolished, he was a mess, but he was so smart and funny and funny. So when I was doing this and I'm like, who reflects the way we need to ask a question? And asking an additional question, it's not about interrogating somebody like you might think I'm saying, uh, but it's about appreciation and taking the time to have a theory or to say, I heard you and I need more information. And, and it can open up a whole new experience. So in your book, you give an example um, about mm -hmm. the power of asking a last question. You are stuck in some crazy traffic jam mm -hmm. and you decided after doing going through your car chore drawer 
you you cleaned your wallet, you wrote, you called all your friends, right? So hours have gone by and you're getting bored and you get out of your car and you start walking around talking to people in the cars around you. And you tell us about that experience and why asking those last questions were so important. I'm going to use this example and then I hope we have time for one more that's even more real. It's all about procurement. I don't know why supply chain people and procurement keep showing up in my life. I wasn't talking to the entire traffic jam. There were thousands and it was three hours. So I was running out of stuff to do. So, so I talked to the guy next to me. He ends up working with my husband in the same school. Thousands. One conversation. Another guy comes piling out of his car because he's bored and he saw me talking. He ends up working with the pharmaceutical company. They were going through a restructuring and I gave him my card and I was talking about they giving you a career transition, call me. Later that night, I'm talking to a friend because we're planning a coaching session on a podcast and he's like, sit down. I know you've been sitting a while, Jules, but take a moment because I know that guy. I coached him and his team. I'm thinking there were thousands of people, the numbers, anybody of you doing AI or algorithms or something, you could figure out like, what are the odds? We were millions of people in New York and three people had a connection. So that's one thing. The other thing about the new a connection, asking more and more question is again, New Jersey, over there doing a training session. And when I give a session, there's a certain rhythm to what happens with the group, or what certain dynamics are gonna happen when people need to start talking to each other. It's less about me talking at them at a certain point and them working and communicating and having fun. So there's an energy. I give, I get to the session, I'm thinking, great, what a nice diverse mix of people, nationalities, genders, ages, marketing people, accounting, research. It was perfect. Do my talk, ask a question, somebody would answer. And then it was like, no ripples on the water. Another question, no ripples on the water. Third one, there's the little inner voice. The left logic plane is jumping up going, you've lost your touch. This is not good. You're, this is the point they should be gelling. What is happening? On the other side of me was the gal who was saying, as this question, listen to me. I asked the group, 25 people and looking at me, what is your Myers-Briggs? They were all introverts. It was like watching the rockets of Myers-Briggs. They all raised their hands when it came to I, and not only they were I, they were really high I. But here's the thing that happened. Once I asked the right question, I understood how we need to work together. I became the extrovert whisperer. I heard them, I got them, I understood. They start to connect and then they never shut up. So <laughs> it was amazing. So that always stands with me. First of all, ask a question, listen to your gut and things happen. And I also had some fun with it too. But that was, I thought that's it, I'm toast. I can never work again, that's it. But asking the question helps, that one question. So oh, I want to round out our conversation today talking about being authentic and mm. for, for those of us who are in procurement, I know this is particularly relevant and really important as we're going out and building stakeholder trust, trying to build rapport and be able to have a seat at the table and really um, be able to influence and work with um, people that may be from many different walks of life. Mm -hmm any different backgrounds and have really no idea what procurement does and, and what value that we can provide. So what does being authentic mean to you and how can procurement people use being authentic to build better relationships? It's coming as you are. Look, we're, we have a lot in common. We're also complimentary because right now you're very elegant. You're speaking very calmly and I'm talking with my hands. <laughs> We are like, we don't need to even put like a subtitle. Like this is examples. We're coming to this as we are. We appreciate how we're different and then how we're not, you know? So I think you have to show up and say, I can't be fake. I learned a valuable lesson about the fact that my humor was appreciated. My, my style was appreciated and it serves a purpose in situations. And I'm not saying about joking, um, it's humor to teach, to open up a dialogue, to build trust, to get to tougher things and more dynamic issues. 
but you're being authentic. You've always taken an interest in people. And that is something that people um, appreciate. You can't fake it, I think, um, whether it's on a video or not. People know when you mean, mean what you say. And I think it's also about backing up what you say. If you say you care about your team and you're interested, it shows in the actions. You can put all the words out there, but how you present. Um, I could have met, I met you in Indianapolis. Um, and at first I thought, this can't be real that you keep meeting people and meeting people. You know, I may never hear from you again. And then when you texted me, I was like, oh, wow, okay. That was the proof. So you could have said, I'll call you. And I would have said, yeah, right. <laughs> I would have been very New York. Yeah, later. <laughs> See you around. But you, you showed up again. And then I met you in New York. So that's how you show. I don't think you can tell somebody to be authentic. People read your language. Kids and dogs are actually very good observers of behavior. They can tell if somebody's um, real or not. I think we have to take a lesson from them. I, I think a couple things that I've learned in my career about being authentic, working in procurement, my expertise is in the marketing space and marketing mm -hmm. and procurement typically don't work well together. Marketing <laughs> is kind of doing their own thing and wants nothing to do with procurement. And one of the things that I've learned about being authentic when you're working with stakeholders is be very open and honest about what you're not good at or what you've never done before. Don't try to pretend like you know everything about sourcing contingent labor or you know everything about IT or everything about media or print procurement. Be very open and say, these are my strengths. This is what I can do really well. You know, I'm, I'm not as strong in these areas or I, I'm really good at doing these types of things. And I think you can develop a strategy and plan that will highlight and make sure that you're set up for success. And the other thing I think is focusing on small wins. Mm -hmm. Don't come in and try to take over everything, right? Mm -hmm. if, if I'm meeting with the marketing team for the first time and I want to take over their $2 billion budget, that's not going to go well, and you're going to be um, asked to leave, and you're not going to have an opportunity to work with them again. But if you come in and say, you know, what are some of those really small kind of nuisance things that you're working on or doing, mm -hmm. and try to pick up those types of projects and do a great job and build trust over time, they'll see that you're really authentic in what you're doing and you'll be able to have bigger wins and, and take over more of the spend over time. Yeah, I, I worked with procurement as one of my internal clients at the beginning when they were starting to go into professional services. And I saw a lot of the poor choices that were made when they went in with an agenda and said, we're here to help and then did the wrong thing and didn't take into account a lot of things and pretend to be an expert. I have really good stories, so we can't talk about them now. Um, at, you have to put yourself in the any sales, whether it's internal consulting or coaching, what's in it for the client or the coach and what's their concern? So you, I think investing time, listening and learning their, their business. I did it with recruiting. I did it when I was coaching. I do it when I was doing change work investing in the time to learn what is unique to them and then being able to offer some value. And you're right, it's sometimes fans getting an answer on an email is a small win. Sometimes if they just you know, take a moment to set up a time, use that time accordingly, take an interest, keep asking questions. And it takes, a, we talked about this in other occasions where you ask more questions uh, than you, um, give responses sometimes at the beginning of a relationship. And we all have agendas, but you have to put those aside and say, give it time. It'll happen if it's meant to happen and um, get resources that'll help. Sometimes you need partners when you're going to have certain conversations um, so they can feel comfortable. So I can speak their language and um, show where I can bring some value. But as you know, build long-term relationships along the way because that uh, keeps showing up. That, that, that's what Queens taught you. You got to be tough. <laughs> Keep commuting to that office or being on that phone. That's the, uh, the advice for today. Well, Jules, we are at time. So ah. I want to uh, do a big thank you to our yeah. guests today, Julie and Ryan. Again, I'll do my show and tell. Um, <laughs> highly recommend her book. You can get it on Amazon. It's a really fun, short, quick read. 
I'm flipping through, I want to say it's like 70 pages, lots of pictures and graphics, and it's talking about how to uh, better leverage your communication skills, both in procurement and really whatever profession and in your personal life as well. So Jules, I'm going to ask that you uh, bid us goodbye um, in a, in a, a Queen's, is it a Queen's site? Am I saying that correctly? Queen's site, Queen's site matter. So how is your commute? How are you going to get out of here? Do you know where you're going? Do you need directions? I mean, do you have enough food? Because if I was with you, I'd pack you a bag of food just to tide you over until you get home. And when you get home, you're going to call me, right? Yeah, because otherwise they're going to call every relative and friend you have and freak everybody out if you don't get back to me. All right? You know this, right? You, you promise? All right, Jules. Well, thank you so much. <laughs> <You're so paused. laughs> thanks to all of the uh, uh, attendees today. And Kathy, I'll turn it over to you.